I'm going to cover today is kind of research at O'Reilly, what we do. Uh, our view of the data space, there's a lot of people talking about it. A few examples, and at the end, some suggestions about how to incorporate data more into what you're doing. So at O'Reilly, we, um, we really try to do the, the mission of O'Reilly, try to support that as best we can, which is changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. And we do that by trying to tap, um, work on technology uh, adoption trends. Oops. That's okay. And um, we have, I'll say we have three people in the group. I'm kind of on the data side. We've got a quantitative analyst. You'll see uh, a little more about him later. And um, there's someone to handle our operations. So we're, we're pretty small, we're pretty tight, and we do all the, uh, all the pieces of it. And we've put together a big book scan repository for our topic around computers. So we've got a thousand um, technology topics in a taxonomy. We keep everything back to 2004. We have 11 dimensions, so each book has kind of 11 characteristics we can look at. And we augment that with, with job data, with um, going out to the web to pull stuff. You can see the list of some of the stuff we pull. And we try to make some of that accessible, and you'll see some of the tools we use to uh, do that. So what's going on with data? Well, the first quote there about the sexy job of the coming decade comes from Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at Google. And there really is a lot going on in the space. Sunday's New York Times had an article on big data. Um, there's obviously more data around it. There's sensor data. There's our mobile phones. There's social graphs in the data. There's images, videos. There's just, just a lot more to look at. And the tools have kind of kept up. So you can have a small team like ours that can do everything. The skills are, are integrated. And people are coming from all sorts of places to get into it. So you're finding physics majors doing finance, quant stuff, bio uh, folks doing regular business work. In a lot of ways, what characterizes the geeky part is that machine learning and natural language processing have become mainstream tools. I do machine learning all the time and trying to make sense of our uh, data. And this is where you behind the scenes of some of the things you see. Plus, there's machine learning companies like Google and LinkedIn and Facebook. And we even have a conference covering this space. There was so much going on, talking about it. It's been a very successful conference. So why do you do it? I'm breaking up stories from decision processes because it's a point I want to make that data on its own isn't very interesting without a narrative. So you should think about that. And this is how to communicate your results. Showing someone numbers or just giving someone access to a bunch of numbers, without context, it can be kind of tough. You want it to be an input to the decision process, not the decision process itself. And I'm going to emphasize that point throughout. The last thing, real-time integration, not really my topic, but it's a reason people are, are excited about data. There's a term data science going around and covers uh, a bunch of areas. There's a lot of ways to cut this. The way that I'm cutting it is kind of a functional way, is that on the one side, you manage data. You've got to acquire it. You might have to clean it up. You've got to organize it. On the other side, you're trying to make sense of it. You're trying to gather insights. Those are the two key parts. Probably the most important part is you need a culture that can accommodate the data. That means people need to understand a message that you're giving. It's a math background, so enumeracy can be a problem. Um, how to value the input, how to understand the, you know, the problems that could be involved there. And what's really important is to think in an experimental way. You'll see that I've got the word hypothesis a bunch of times, that a lot of your business is around hypothesis. And really, the most important part is to stay curious, keep asking questions. So at O'Reilly, we have a pretty good data culture. And where does it start? Well, it starts at the top. Tim is very quantitative. Uh, he and I have worked on a lot of analysis where there's a lot of back and forth on it. It's been really great. We have a real quant, Ben Lorica. He is a PhD in partial differential equations. He was a hedge fund quant. When I was looking for this picture of him, I went on Google Images, typed his name, and on page two, there were more charts than pictures. So this is the kind of person that, that you'd like to get. And then just on the publishing side, Joe just introduced me, and this is the most pandering slide I've ever done. Um, Always asking questions. Can we find out this? You've told me this. Is there something behind it? And even, there's Joe, and then even the person who runs the company, uh, Laura Baldwin, is a math major. So there's a lot of, uh, we don't have to explain as much, and, and folks get it, which is really great. So 
If you're going to analyze data, one of the things you might need is a taxonomy. And I'd say in most cases, you need to organize your data. You can't make sense of it or drill up and down, which is kind of the fundamental way that people tend to look at data, kind of summary detail. Uh, and there's orthogonal dimensions. In our case, as a tech publisher, an object-oriented book with Java is about object-oriented programming and has a language of Java. So knowing that there's orthogonal dimensions to everything. And that, in our case, we're in a dynamic world. The BISAC isn't keeping up. So you do have a taxonomy that might work for you, but you might need to augment it, and certainly we have. And they're hard. They're a mess. You might have multiple roll-ups. We have four of them. Um, we uh, don't always keep up with it. So it's something you probably have to do, but not always something that can be done. So for access, we have a research portal, and I am going to do the most dangerous thing you can do and go to a live demo. So are you guys seeing that? I guess not. OK, great. Oh, you're, you're not seeing the website, though. OK. There we go. OK. So this is, a, this is our taxonomy. The colors represent the growth and um, shrinkage of uh, topics. The size represents the units sold. So if something's big, there's more units sold. If it's small, there's fewer. And um, I'm going to drive from here. Um, we, and we can change from, this is sequential. You can change to year over year, quarter over quarter. You can change to week or month. And it'll just, in fact, I'll just do month quick here. So if you see something here, say, ah, oh, there's an anomaly. So I'm going to look at iPad here. And then one click, we get the graph dashboard. This shows us the topic and its sales. iPad is clearly a holiday-oriented thing. We also see our, um, the share by publisher. We have a histogram, so we understand what the topic looks like. Is there one book that really leads? In this case, there is. Or is there a lot of books that have similar sales? And then we've got a list of books. And let's just say we want to see, well, what might be going on behind that, that the graph was red and that there was a big drop. And there we've got year to date what's been going on with the uh, top three books. We can see that the top seller has had a, a bit of a drop. So I really didn't click very much, and I went from the complete summary view down to book detail. And this is what I mean about, like, in a way, the, the uh, interface has a narrative to it. So I'll get back to the slides. Okay. Now, one of the things we do is people use that, but we also do a newsletter where we try to explain what's going on. So we have data. It's pretty consistent. And a narrative, what might be going on. We you know, spot anomalies. We do special studies, and we put it in that. We also try to make it offbeat, uh, try to keep people's uh, interest in it. In this case, there had been a flat uh, spurt of sales, or spurt's not the right word, but sales were flat for a particularly long time. So everything there has to do with flats, which leads me to a quick digression. If I were to take that flat area of sales and put it into the default of Excel, this is what comes out. It doesn't look very flat. Well, what's missing is that the y-axis, the thing on the left there, doesn't have zero. Um, you don't get a sense of magnitude, and there's really no context. The flat section is really to the right there. You can see it's pretty flat around week 42, 44. There's a zero axis, so you can see that it's flat. It's different than the rest of the year. So you can provide data, but without the right context, without uh, paying attention to magnitude and stuff, you can be misleading. So how do we use it? We're, on a, we're talking about data uh, here, so I thought I'd take a data topic. As a publisher, we want to think about, do we publish in these areas? SAS is a mature data and analytic tool. Hadoop is a rising new tool. And machine learning is a technique people use to make sense of uh, data. It's been around a long time, but it's um, becoming kind of more interesting. So the first thing we want is context. The top is all jobs. We're looking at job data here. So this is how we augment books with other things. And then we look at our topics. Now, we see SAS has a much higher magnitude than the other two. And it looks pretty much like the regular job market. It's not that different. So that's interesting to us. But now we want to drill down into those two new areas, Hadoop and machine learning. And we see that, wow, sales, when you drill down, are really behaving quite differently than um, 
the job market as a whole. If people are going into these jobs, they might need content, and it might be a good publishing area for us. So this is how we bring in outside data and try to make sense of it. Now, for special studies, we had this concept we call supply-side analytics. A lot of people talk to us in the company. We're in the data a lot. We have opinions on what might be going on, or we might notice something. So without anyone telling us, we will commission our own studies. And this is an example of one of those things. I noticed that the top couple books seem to be selling at a pretty high rate. It's like, what, what might be going on there? Um, this chart shows what percentage of all sales the top five books had. And you can see it's really spiked since the holiday. And it's even stayed pretty high afterwards. And even going back to 2004, there's never been anything like this. So there's a hypothesis about this. but. When we looked at the chart, that one chart is like, is there a seasonal affect? So we look at this, and we see there is some seasonality, but this is still quite an anomaly uh, with it. So we're going to monitor this, continue to monitor this closely. The environment's changed. There's less shelf space for computer books, probably fewer impulse buys. The top books tend to be consumer-oriented titles. And if it keeps up, it might affect our publishing program strategy. Uh, if it isn't, it was a perfect storm. Most of the books were about iPad, Kindle, and iPhones. A lot of people bought them this year, and maybe it's just the books were great. Now I'm going to talk a little about how that taxonomy comes into play. For a geeky publisher like us, JavaScript is an important topic, and we're the leading publisher in this space. So the first thing I'm showing here is the rate of change. So the overall JavaScript is the one to the right, and O'Reilly is in red, and we're growing faster than the market, so that's a good thing. One publisher is growing much faster, and another one is, is losing a little share. So you want to look at a little more detail. The top graph on the right is how many books are published. So this is the number of books there. And then the bottom chart is how many units those books are selling. So actually, the three publishers that we're focusing on have pretty similar publishing programs, but we have a very successful uh, kind of a dominant share. So are we saturating the market? So we look a little more, and we have this measure of efficiency. In this case, we're looking at efficiency as how many units per book are we selling, and we're doing much better than the market. We altered that a little with this alternate view where 100% would be that every book on JavaScript sold the same amount. So we're pretty far above that, a good sign that the market might not be saturated. This might be a topic where we can continue to publishing, publish in it and can continue to have some, some success. So what can you do? How do you make data more in your, your wheelhouse? Um, getting data savvy is something you have to do. You can't like buy a big data uh, and expect to just know what you're doing. So finding someone like a Ben uh, is important. Um, I started a math club at one time. Understanding probability, understanding a little bit of the math behind this, understanding what certain things mean will be important. I think it's important to keep the analysis close to the data because you want to be agile. You want to be pretty fast. And if you separate those out, particularly in bigger companies where you might have a data group and an analytics group and a design group that might do the charts, Everyone is going to be waiting for someone else. I think integration is really important. Go outside. There's a lot of outside data. Don't just rely on your inside data. We, we look at Twitter streams. We look at stuff going on in Facebook. We have to be clever to figure out what, what is going on. This is a bit of a specialized skill. And there's a lot of meetups going on around this. There's a lot of outside people. There's events that you can go to. Encourage people to participate. We're in a kind of a nascent uh, phase of the data space. And there's a lot to learn. And if you can find out what other people are doing, it's great stuff to bring in. And internally, you need to vet everything. It's too easy to make a mistake. In our case, uh, Ben and I look over each other's analysis every time. And we, we have the smell test. Does this seem right to go forward? Um, I've mentioned experimentation a couple times. It should be fundamental. And you should think about a new risk. When you're evaluating projects to take on and so forth, if you don't run something, what aren't you learning? And then if you look at things that way, you might start thinking about just your whole business process in a different way. 
hypothesis, test, feedback, rechange. Not that different from what Eric Reese was uh, saying yesterday. I think the notion of supply-side analytics, trusting any kind of analytic group you have to do some on their own, is, is good. And that means they need a sandbox. They need some equipment, some tools, so they can grab a bunch of data, who knows from where, compile it in, try to associate it with the other stuff that you have. Communicate with stories. I've shown you a lot of data. There weren't too many numbers in what I showed. And mostly, I think, I used stories to kind of convey what was in there. And scale up your decision making to match data. There's a, a story that's told in data circuits about the CIA in the 70s started getting satellite imagery. They would look at every picture and try to figure out every possible outcome of what was going on. And they were in a paralytic stasis for 10 years. What you want to be able to do is, if you're getting new data in, is make sure that you're processing it in a way that you're being efficient, that you're not overanalyzing, that you're using, in a lot of times, the most simple way to, to do things. So, data, it's not a black box. And honest to God, when I was writing this down, I was watching Baratunde, and I thought, how not to be a black box? <laughs> that should be the next uh, book we do. And it's not a magic bullet. There's problems with numeracy. I'll give you a second to look at this sign. Right? So you've got to be careful. It's hard work, working in the coal mine. It's a process with no end. You're never going to learn everything. Staying curious all the time is something you're going to have to do. It requires vigilance. It requires resources. Um, it's a bit of an art. There's a lot of science, of course, involved in this, but there's a lot of art to designing an experiment and figuring things out. I hate it when someone comes to me and says, hey, I've got this data, how long before you find something out? I, I don't know. I, you know. I've got to explore it. I've got to figure out what's going on. But like a lot of things that are hard, it can be kind of fun and rewarding. So I think with what's going on, it's what you need to keep running. This is what, you know, if you're not getting involved in data, someone is going to figure it out before you. The other reward, you know, so you get to still play the game, is enlightenment. Now, I don't know if you're going to get this. Nirvana means enlightenment. Nirvana. And, boy, if I can hold this, set this thought out for 25 seconds, I've timed it perfectly. With enlightenment comes bliss. <laughs> and I really think going through this, it's a really rewarding thing to incorporate into your business. And just remember, it's not free, and it's going to require some investment on your part and some, uh, some effort. But I think it'll be worth it in the long run. And that's it. Thank you.